Shabbat day, everybody. Shea Heather Fleming Inishia. Um, I am the executive director of Change Labs in Tuba City, and I want to welcome all of you to the first dialogue in a four-part series that we're hosting between now and December 8th. I'm going to give you a little bit more context about what this dialogue encompasses, but today we're focused on Navajo tourism. And before we dive into it, I wanted to give you all some really quick context around what Change Labs is, who we are, and introduce some of our team members here with us today. So first and foremost, Change Labs is a Navajo nonprofit that is working to support and foster Navajo small businesses. And specifically what we're doing is pro providing creative workspace, tools, resource, and knowledge for Native American entrepreneurs. Now that's pretty broad, so I did want to give you a little bit more of a concrete example of how we help Navajo business owners. Um, and I'll preface that by saying that the most common question that we get from members of our community is, how do I start a business? Um, if that is you, what I would recommend is every Monday we host virtual business coaching. And hopefully someday post-pandemic, this will be back to in-person. But if you want to talk to a business coach about anything, you know, um, I have this idea, what do you think? Where do I find funding? Uh, what resources are available to me? I encourage you to go to our website, nativestartup.org, hit backslash events, and you can book um, an appointment with any of our coaches on Mondays. Uh, I also encourage all of you to check out our business incubator. This is a 12 month program designed for high potential Navajo and Hopi entrepreneurs who have an idea and maybe they need um, some support getting their idea off the ground. It's a fantastic program. Uh, my colleague, Jessica Castego is an attendee today and she runs the business incubator. If you'd like to learn more about that, also go to our website and hit backslash incubator. And then finally, Sessions like this, we're recording all the time and we've de developed quite an archive of videos, how-tos, tutorials, um, inspirational sessions with Native American leaders, thought leaders and business owners. I highly recommend that you check out our YouTube channel. We now have, I think it's actually way more than 35 at this point, but all kinds of great videos um, led by Native American entrepreneurs and creatives and thought leaders around um, some of the most popular business topics and questions that we get, like social media marketing, how to build a website, how to use a business model canvas, and so on. If you have any more questions about Change Labs and what it is that we do, I would like to direct you to my colleague, Marsha Grayeyes, who's based in Tuba City. Um, there's Marsha's email right there, and that is our website if you'd like to learn anything more about Change Labs. So some quick logistics for today's webinar. Um, raise your Zoom hand if you'd like to speak. I don't think that I, I, next in the next session, I'll put an illustration about how to raise your Zoom hand, but I'm really hopeful that if you just um, roll over the bottom of your screen, there'll be a little option to raise your hand. So if you ever want to go unmuted and speak, please raise your hand. Otherwise, there is a Q&A box. So if you click on Q&A, anybody should be able to type in a question. And I believe you can anonymize your question if you, you know, don't feel like assigning your name to it. Um, I believe question and answers are gonna be diverted till the end, but feel free to populate the Q&A box at any single time. And yes, this session is being recorded for YouTube. So if you have to bow out early or you wanna rewatch something or you wanna be able to forward this along to a friend or family member, we will send a follow-up email after the session with a link to this video on our YouTube channel. And then as I mentioned in the beginning, this is just, this is just the first of a four-part series. So I really hope that we can see some of you next week when we venture into the food and hospitality industry. At the beginning of December, we'll be talking about artisans, retail, and professional service providers. And on December 8th, the final dialogue is gonna be about our priorities. It'll take everything that we've learned listening to business owners and, um, and government entities in these next three weeks and um, synthesize all that information to think through 
okay, now that we know, now that we've heard the needs of business owners, how is that being translated into um, the 2 billion in ARPA funding that the Navajo Nation has? A quick overview of today's format. Um, all of these dialogues are based on research conducted by our partners at Causal Design, the Navajo Nation Division of Economic Development and Change Labs. So it's really, for a foundational understanding, I think it's really important that we dive into what research was conducted, how it was done, and what some of the learnings were from that. We're gonna do that in the first 15 minutes. And from there, we have some very special guests with us today, um, two Navajo business owners, and also um, the director of the Navajo Tourism Department, moderated by my colleague, Christine Laughter of Change Labs. They will have a short discussion about some of the research findings in the report, and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask their questions, to put forward your ideas, to share your stories, anything that's um, related to the topic today. All right, and with that, I am gonna hand it over to my colleague, Raymar from Causal Design to walk us through the report. Welcome Raymar and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, great, yep. Um, hello all, uh, my name is, uh, is Raymar Macarinus and I'm a, uh, a researcher at, uh, at Causal Design. Um, I'm accompanied uh, today by um, a colleague of, colleague of mine, uh, Matt Click as well, who I just want to recognize was um, a formative part of uh, collecting the, the data required to, uh, to create this report. Um, that said, I'll just go ahead and jump, uh, jump straight into it. You know, I want to, I want to thank our, our Change Labs colleagues here for the um, for the opportunity to partner with them on their continued work in supporting uh, the Navajo community and and of course for the uh, Division of Economic Development for helping to fund our our research which of course um, includes analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on the uh, on the Navajo small business uh, community. Um, um, for those of you who uh, who are not familiar, Causal Design um, is an organization that's dedicated to supporting organizations like Change Labs in um, in developing cultures of evidence um, of uh, of using data and analysis to try to make informed decisions about causes that um, that they focus on or, or that they care about within their community. Um, and we've had the privilege ourselves of working with um, with Change Labs since 2016 to help better understand and improve um, their ability to carry out. Their, their mission of supporting the, uh, the, the Navajo small business community. Um, a quick jump here into the, uh, the study objectives. So the, the report primarily focused on, on these, three, um, these three research questions. Um, a lot of the focus today will be on the main takeaways um, from number one, but you know, our report did touch on all of these pieces and, and um, we hope that the discussion today and, and the, the future discussions will also help round out um, sort of you know, how we're trying to inform or, or answer these, uh, these study objectives objectives. Um, in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, the, the methodology. And so, you know, based on kind of early engagement with, with Change Labs, as well as with um, DED, we looked at a full range of um, potential sources for data to try to understand, okay, how can we, how can we get at this idea of trying to understand how best uh, uh, to try to best understand how COVID has impacted different aspects of the small business community. And based on what was available, based on what um, we were able to get from, um, from some of our, our, our uh, stakeholders and from, of our, part, uh, from our partners, um, we chose to do these uh, two different approaches and really combine them. Um, the first was a small business deep dive, um, which was really meant to try to get at kind of the narrative and individual stories that that business owners um, were having, and to really try and understand that experience um, of of running a small business during this time, um, you'll see that uh, you know we tried our best to, to span these um, interviews across various um, various chapters of uh, of Navajo Nation, as well as across. Uh, different sectors that were identified as, as key to the small business community. Um, to go along with that, 
um, with this approach and to supplement it. Um, we also conducted what, what we called a market mapping exercise. And, and really for us, this was meant to try to find and, and examine from a high level, what were the different, um, what were the different constraints and barriers to carrying on and, and, and doing business as usual for, um, for different parts of the small business um, community. And, you know, by, our hope and aim was that in taking these two pieces and, and putting them together, we could um, we could paint a larger picture of what was going on across the the uh, the economy, but also take in and understand how those um, how those nuances how how those uh, how the stories differ when we look at. Um, different sectors, when we look at different experiences, knowing that, right, that it wasn't going to necessarily all be, you know, experienced in the same way across all businesses on the reservation. Um, here is just a very quick kind of uh, example of, of, or illustration of what kind of this mark market mapping exercise looked like for us. Um, on the left side, you'll see we, um, we would focus and look at all the ways in which small businesses acquire inputs, things that they need to run their business um, and manage it on the on the day to day, right? So, you know, these can be um, supplies. This can be needed um, permits and 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 regulatory pieces uh, to conduct their work. Um, in in contrast, we have on the on the right side the ways in which the small business community, or in this case, the sectors that we looked at, the ways in which they access their customers, their, the way that they're able to then reach the communities that they serve, and how these things have been impacted um, by COVID. So. You know, what we've tried to note and isolate are where we think or where we've identified kind of various levels of, of disruption and where um, where the different members of the community have been able to, I guess, evolve or find new approaches to, to dealing with these things. Um, and with that, we'll, we can go into kind of the main primary takeaways of, uh, of the research. So with the first, um, uh, the first takeaway here, you know, I, I do want to focus and kind of stress that you know, while while this first piece around kind of the the full human toll of COVID is quite obvious, uh, our research led us to focus a bit more on how you know within that larger human toll um, that that the that was really at the um, caused by the pandemic. Um, what we wanted to note is just the 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 limited availability or. Um, or presence of you know what we would call vital support business or professional networks. Um, while there wasn't any sort of um, lack in personal networks and and kind of things that we would you know uh, describe as kind of so more more social, what we did find is that the ability to then turn to kind of professional groups to um, to business organizations, you know, what wasn't necessarily as present or not something that was um, that was recognized across a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, interviewees that we spoke with. Um, so that's something that we wanted to highlight as a piece, uh, as one of the main takeaways. Um, on the on the next slide, we wanted to highlight how this. You know th this lack of support network um, and kind of the impact of not having those formal formal networks was compounded by just um, you know what we know to be just historical um, difficulties in doing business on the Navajo Nation. So in a previous report that that we had done for Change Labs, we had we had highlighted um, a lot of these barriers to doing business, and you know what what we found is that you know obviously there's this interaction with um, with COVID and the pandemic and and how in many cases right that the the uh, what we would consider really onerous processes only become even harder or or more difficult or more of a burden on businesses when we have um, when we have this larger you know economic shock in the background. Um, the next piece is that uh, you know highlights how you know, support when given. So, right. So, you know, we, we've highlighted that, um, you know, that while we have kind of this um, difficult and, and, and onerous process in terms of doing a business, when government does work and when we are able to organize and support um, businesses through, through these relief grants, these are very, you know, 
um, overwhelmingly and unambiguously um, important and vital to helping businesses get that extra breathing room that they need to continue um, to continue their work and to continue to keep their to keep their doors open. And so, you know, to us, the main highlight there is that this need does exist. That um, financial resources are really important, and uh, you know, um, provide one outlet for really supporting and the community moving forward. But, um, but I think our, our next takeaway will also underline and highlight another aspect of this is that um, uh, finances probably won't be enough, right? So small businesses currently face a number of compounding challenges that are really layered on top of each other. So, you know, while I've highlighted um, that you know financial support is is really useful. There's an overall kind of uncertainty in costs that business owners face now, whether that's through inflation, whether it's through the uh, kind of lack of um, availability or uncertainty around receiving goods and supplies, with all the, you know the supply chain issues going on right now. Um, to, to other issues, right? Limited support options that were available. So some of those pieces I highlighted earlier, the inability to, to turn to either some other formal networks to get um, uh, information, um, down to, right, changes in, in um, the availability of labor, the movement of staff and, and individuals to help support these businesses is now constrained. And then finally, we have just general operation restrictions the ability to open in the first place or the ambiguity around what it means to open and, and how we might open um, when, uh, when, when folks are allowed to, uh, to, 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 you know, to travel across, um, across borders and, um, uh, and, and what that might look like, right? So that all of these pieces um, come together to create really a series of, of challenges that would go beyond just just financial support. And so, you know, but based on this, we, we do have some kind of top level recommendations that, you know, we, we hope that, um, that we hope we address. Oh, sorry, I've, I've missed the slide here. So this last piece, um, we want to highlight as kind of where, where we, where we landed in terms of building out this, um, this market map that I had talked about, right? Trying to understand when we think about tourism, what do these disruptions look like? And so on the left side, right, I had mentioned these inputs, things that are vital to, um, to reopening. So on the tourism side, really, you know, th there's this combined piece of uh, limited access to, to the required permits, to the required um, access to regulatory licenses that you need to operate, right? Both, uh, both in terms of accessing them at the state level, but also um, accessing them within Navajo Nation and, and, and kind of navigating through the Parks and Recreation uh, Office that, um, that may not be open or, or may not have information to share about when, um, when those permits would resume. Um, in the same token, right, access to inputs, um, given some of those issues that I highlighted earlier around costs around availability of goods, those are um, heavily constrained. Um, and of course, uh, tourism is going to, you know, in terms of access to customers, um, have a really rough time in, in engaging folks if we don't have that in-person contact and in-person flow uh, of, uh, of, of customers, right? And, you know, if, from what we know, there's not necessarily an easy way or alternative way of accessing. It's not as if tourism can be necessarily um, moved online like it could with some of the other sectors. Um, so moving on then to the next slide and thinking about kind of the high level um, recommendations, you know, we really have then boiled them down into kind of four, um, four areas where we think that, you know, we can look at very specific support for, uh, for the small business community and, and also into some of the sectors specifically. So on the larger business environment, um, uh, I, we wanted to highlight a couple things. And so, you know, ensuring that there's that continued communication around reopening, around what that means, what that's going to look like, what, what's going to be involved and, and what the larger timeline looks like, right? Small businesses don't have as much wiggle room in being able to forecast, um, uh, you know, cash flow in the same way that larger, uh, larger businesses or, or, or uh, you know, larger industry can. And so knowing and having a better sense of, of that timeline will be really important. Um, the, the next two down here around um, 
coordination of collective marketing and, and support, uh, supporting um, the development of a, of a sector specific small business network really talks about um, in some ways that, that um, network that I, that I had mentioned earlier. They, you know, it, it, it shouldn't necessarily fall on a single business to have to then make the case that the Navajo Nation has a, as a whole is is open again for for business, and so um, what we had suggested here is some larger coordination effort that then it, you know helps send out the message and helps do kind of that needed marketing that will probably be needed to start to attract um, customers again, and and to do that through some kind of network and association that advocates to them so that it doesn't fall on any single small business, but then engages that community as a whole. Um, for the uh, for the next piece around um, providing direct to business support, um, it, it really has to do with right trying to figure out how we ensure or, or, or create some of that um, uh, this, some of that that support group uh, or, or support activity. So creating simplified support systems that you can engage through either the government or through these through these networks will be really vital. Um, whether it looks like dedicated support centers or through you know groups that um, are meant to go out and engage um, and 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 increase or, or deliver kind of capacity building through you know. Uh, enhanced business education and things like that. Um, we, we see that as, as pretty vital. And then on the uh, on the next piece, providing sector support. Again, if we're talking about um, tourism here, it, uh, you know, one of the things that we think is unique is really around right permits and and um, and zoning issues. So making sure that that process is facilitated so that you know, when things reopen up again, that that it's that it's very clear and that that information is readily available for folks. So that way we can effectively hit the ground running um, and um, and and get this uh, and get the industry going again. Um, in terms of addressing long-term resilience, there's a, a larger case here around how we streamline how business engages with the. Um, with the Division of Economic uh, Development, as well as uh, you know the Navajo Nation as a whole, we obviously want to streamline or you know, advocate for streamlining processes and access to information and, and things like the registration process. Um, and, and in doing so, once once we've done that, then would advocate to move towards things like digitization and, and kind of a larger modernization, right? So all of these things in tandem, we think, right, would address some of these long-term issues that we had um, pointed out earlier, only make the situation even harder. And, you know, within the background of that would advocate for increased capacity uh, and infrastructure, particularly improved broadband infrastructure to then be able to, um, uh, to capitalize on on digitization and kind of uh, all these other modernization efforts. So, um, you know, th again, these are kind of high level recommendations on our end. Um, we definitely welcome the conversations like, like these where we try to dive specifically into sectors and what they're hoping to look at. And so, you know, with that, we're, we're really excited to, to then talk to some of our panelists here. Thank you, Raymar. Okay. On that vein, I am going to bring some of our panelists online here. Okay, fantastic. And now I would like to introduce you all to my colleague and friend, Christine Lafter. Christine is the Director of Kinship Lending, which is Change Lab's micro lending program for Navajo and Hopi startups and business owners. Welcome, Christine. Oh, wait. One more thing, actually, while Christine is turning on her audio. Um, over the, over the, the next 20 minutes while we're having the panel discussion, attendees, you may notice that there are some questions popping up on your screen. These are a series of polls that we've designed because the whole point of these dialogues is to get as much information that we can from the Navajo business community in order to shape the December 8th discussion on ARPA priorities. So if you're so inclined, go ahead and respond to the polls as they're popping up on your screen, and I will be sharing the results of those polls as well. Okay, now handing it over to you, Christine. Yeah, um, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, as Heather said, I'm Christine Lafter and the Director of Kinship Lending at Change Labs. Um, I am Naka Dene'a, born for Tachitni, and I'm from the community of Kayenta. So it's good to see one of our Kayenta businesses also here today. 
Um, I do want to introduce um, a couple of our business owners. Uh, so the first one is Lewis Williams. Lewis is the owner of Ancient Waves River and Hiking Adventures in Shiprock, New Mexico. And John Yazi is owner of Zifta Adventures from Kayenta. And also um, Arvel McCabe is with the Navajo Nation um, Department of Tourism. So welcome to all of you today. Thank you for being uh, panelists here today. So I'm gonna start with the first um, question. So we saw over the course of the pandemic, that the negative impact of the coronavirus went well beyond the health and safety of people and the ability for businesses to open and went into other critical areas of running a business. So the first question that I have here is for John and Lewis. Um, as business owners, are there issues that you think are especially important for our policymakers and leaders to understand? Oh, Go ahead, definitely. Oh, okay, thank you, John. Hello, everybody. Um, as um, Christine mentioned, my name is Lewis Williams and I'm with Ancient Waves River and Hiking Adventures. And I'm actually from Kent, Arizona myself. And um, uh, we're, we're actually not from Shiprock, New Mexico, or we, we um, run river tours and we're gonna be running from Shiprock. But um, I'm located in, along the San Juan River in Bluff, Utah. Um, so thank you for allowing me to speak, everybody. I'm glad to be here and everybody that's on the, you know, in the panel and you know, invitees. But um, we had a big, huge impact on um, our business and we've seen it firsthand. Um, we, we were actually being located in Bluff. You know, we get, to, we get to see that from the outside looking in, you could say, you know, um, we're registered as a Navajo company. I'm from Kanta, but um, I'm also, we're <clears throat> being a Navajo company, we're registered, we're um, permitted with the BLM. So we get to, still um, conduct tours on BLM land in Utah and Bears Ears country. So we see um, what is going on, you know, in the Navajo Nation consider regarding tourism and um, the, the big impact that we've seen, I've seen that that's gone beyond the health and safety of the people and the ability for businesses to open. Um, I've seen the, a big, big impact on the land um, me being out there hiking and conducting tours all the time, you know, I see the impacts of the land and which uh, the land is very important to everybody, as we all know, as Native, Native Americans. So um, I've seen a big um, increase of travel during this time. You know, people during this time were wanting to get outdoors. So um, being outside and on the trails all the time, I've seen people out there constantly visiting these places and with um and I'm, my concern was about the land you know where everybody was um you know a lot of our companies were were still running tours up up in the bears ears area um so we've seen the the need for you know the regulations to still be um, enforced we needed to be see um, um, the land management issue is big, you know, uh, really absent, I should say, you know, on the San Juan River. So I'd have to say on, um, you know, be, us being in ancient waves, um, we wear a river, we concentrate around the river, we do hiking. So we've seen a big, big um, negative impact on the land. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Um, I'll let John, I'm sure John's got some, you know, some more pointers yeah. to share. With you. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> okay. I just wanted to reiterate what, uh, well, first off, uh, my name is John Yazzie. I'm originally from Tsekho or Coal Mine Canyon by Tiba City. Um, I worked in Tiba as a school, or as an educator, and I moved to Kayenta to work in school administration. 
I'm Zifta Kia Ani, and that's where our, our uh, company name comes from. Um, born for Nast Ezit Kabaha, my Chase are sitting on Jenny, and my Nellies are Twitchy. Um, so, just obviously, uh, we were affected by tourism or by COVID because uh, tourism was all shut down. Um, well, when they started reopening um, the opening plan, I was kind of disappointed that, you know, we couldn't really get a say so. I mean, we were categorized in all uh, tourism as one, and instead of being looked at individually for like uh, funding relief or ARPA funding or, or um, that, um, uh, uh, I forget what it's called, the funding now that we were able to apply for, for uh, re uh, not reimbursement because that's not what it was. Um, um, but anyway, what we do is we run bicycle tours. We run the same tours as the Jeep companies do. And um, so we're outside, we don't have, we don't shuttle, we all meet um, clients, which we haven't done yet. I wanted to clear that up as we haven't officially started. We started our LLC in 2016 and we still have not yet to come off the ground because of, there's honestly, there's too much red tape with the Navajo Nation in regards to, um, recreational companies. Um, I've been hitting every roadblock trying to get my company started. Um, one, the biggest one for the last, uh, for, for three years was Title V, which describes tourism laws. There is no category for biking. And so I keep getting rejected for that by uh, Parks and Rec because there's no category. If you look at it, I mean, I can get a permit for, for Jeep tours, for horseback, for hiking, for rafting, for even hot air balloons, but I can't get a permit for bike bike tours. We were able to talk to our council delegates and our local leaders, and you know they they have been trying to help me get off the ground because um, we're trying to push eco tourism. Um, I would love to see a portion of those jeep tours become eco friendly, and like Lewis said, the the, the land's getting tore up every time we ride to a, a geographical location. That's um of interest, anytime the roads are bad, we just get off our bikes and stay on the same path. Whereas I see the Jeep tours going over and left and right, and they're destroying more of the land, the vegetation. So we're trying to come at the angle of having eco-friendly tours and having tours of less impact, but that's not working out because there's no category. And so we were able to get people to help us, but most of the people that need to hear um, what we're about, don't show up to the meetings. I probably presented to numerous chapters and the biggest people that the bottom line signature on, a, uh, on our packet are the grazing officials. And they're the ones that aren't showing up to any of our meetings to find out what we're about. Um, one example, Hunts Mesa is a huge tourism spot. I've ridden up there a bunch of times. And a lot of locals do, but um, it's also a Jeep route. We've ridden our bikes on that same path and we go up and we do the same thing and we come back down. Um, so when we put in our permit request for Hunts Mesa, it was denied because we're um, bicycles. And they think that we're there to tour, tear up the land, but um, we're not. We, we're, we don't leave a carbon footprint. We're professionals. We're well, I also work as a tour guide for um, Four Corners Guides and bike tours and bike pack rafting. Bike packing is essentially like, load, like backpacking, but you load up all your camping gear, your tents and your food on your bicycle and they make equipment and frame bags and bags to carry all your stuff. You ride for days and you camp and you ride for more days and you camp and you come back. So it's essentially seeing our part of the reservation on bicycles. Um, uh, the only, um, we follow all the, um, the Navajo Nation roads and the bus routes and that's where people aren't seeing or listening to us is they automatically assume that we're on these rocks and doing Red Bull downhill stuff and building trails. We're not. That's not what we're about. Well, thank we're, you, Don. We totally believe in sharing cultural, all the geographical features and the Navajo stories tied to them. That's what we're about. And so that's my biggest obstacle is just the archaic laws that our Navajo Nation used to, to define tourism. Thank you, John and Lewis. Um, Arvel, as department director, um, what are the issues you think are important for business owners and policymakers to understand? 
Good morning. My name is Arvo McCabe. I'm the director for Tourism Navajo Nation. Um, the obstacles that we see throughout um, the tourism industry is just what John said. Many of our community members do not understand exactly what tourism is. The issues that we have um, are when revitalizing a destination, we have to get the chapter involved. And of course you get opposition at every turn and we understand that. Grazing officials are part of the approval process, um, but um, I find that it's better to talk directly to the community member who holds uh, the grazing permit because one-on-one um, -on -one with them rather than going through a third party is quicker to get a signature than to wait on your grazing official to do their job. I understand that a lot of chapters don't come to meetings, but I want to, want to let John know that next time he has a meeting, he can invite us. We can help him with that permitting process. Uh, and that's what we're here for. We're here to assist tourism businesses get off the ground and move forward. My office is charged with, um, like John said, or like John is doing, trying to get um, around parks and rec, uh, those rules and regulations, the red tape, the grazing officials, chapters, all of those individuals are all part of the process. And, um, for me, I can say that I understand where community members are coming from because I too am a chapter president of my community. And I have to take those recommendations that are given to me um, when making decisions as it comes to land. But um, the main obstacle I think is um, those that hold permits. And again, I'm a permittee holder, I understand um, where they're coming from. But at the same time, he also talks about uh, the, the land issue, meaning that um, uh, breaking the land down, more or less. Uh, we have those issues with many communities who come to my office and say, you're not promoting us enough. Why are you not promoting us? Okay, so we do a campaign and we blitz out there come to Chin Li, you know, we'll use them as an example. Um, so they start getting hundreds of thousands of people showing up at Chin Li. Then we get a call that says there's too many people. So, you know, you have to kind of work through those and let the community know that you can't have it both ways. You either are there to make sure that you take care of the land watch uh, how many people uh, it can hold that are visiting and make those adjustments as you see fit. Um, uh, those are some of the um, things that we work with. We also work with grants from the various states. Uh, I'm glad to see that Mr. Lewis is here and I invite him to also, uh, also work with our office. We're in the process of building a new visitor center over in the Shiprock area. And part of that uh, ARPA funding that came up, uh, I just got the word this morning that we moved to the next step, meaning that we got the approval for the visitor center, which is outstanding because that is needed by many of the tour guides to get their information out there. One other thing that we also do is we work with the business regulatory office next door and tour guides or individuals that have tour operations who are wanting to utilize our website to uh, promote their businesses. The only thing that we require is that you're registered with the business regulatory office and we can assist you with those. If you find a grant and you need an agent, you're more than welcome to get a hold of my office. Uh, we can assist you with um, implementing the grant if you need, if it needs to be a government office. So we can help you by assisting you with that. And there are a lot of grants now available to many of the states. And we're going to be starting um, 
a tourism grant or working on a tourism grant with the San Juan County, uh, Utah portion here um, over the next couple of weeks. They wanna do a regionalized uh, grant to cover all that area and include uh, the tourism industry along with economic development. So at that time, we're gonna be requesting chapters get involved, um, community um, members plus tour guides, businesses, um, because we're gonna need a lot of data in order to get um, a lot of money from uh, the state of Utah. The other one is the economic and um, tourism industry grant, the 3.2 billion from New Mexico. Um, there is a grant there also that you can tap into. The same with Arizona. Um, if you need help with any of those, uh, you can contact our office, go to discovernavajo.com, uh, go to email, shoot us an email and we'll get back in contact with you. Or of course you can call my office is 928-810-8501. And I have staff here who can assist you. Um, just give them the information that you're looking for and we can help you. Um, I am of course under economic development. I am not part of uh, the parks department, which is ran by Mr. Um, Begay but we try to work with them as much as we can. And of course, things that we're charged with is uh, advertising and marketing the Navajo Nation and the small businesses that are within the tourism industry. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing all of that information, Mr. McCabe. Um, on to the next um, question. Um, one of the things that stood out when we talked with business owners for this report was the difficulty in getting support with navigating tourism issues and challenges. Lewis, you've previously stated that there's a missing regulatory component that prohibits you from expanding your business and that your business is well known on and off the reservation uh, in the on and off the reservation tourism industry. But the barriers on the Navajo Nation prohibit your ability to meet demand. Um, for John and Lewis, what do you think um, that the resources and supports exist um, but aren't being accessed? Or are there truly no support networks and resources? I can um, touch touch in on that. Um, thank you for that question. Um, some of the so the biggest the obstacles that I've had, you know, we're very unique situation, you know, because we're a Navajo company, but we're we're working with the BLM and the state of Utah to um, to run our tours. So we're actually. <clears throat> We're um, registered with the state of Utah as well. And um, so we, we've, had, um, we've had some support, fortunately, from the Utah, um, U particularly the Utah State University and the Utah Small Business Development Center. So we were very fortunate to have them help us throughout this ordeal, the pandemic. Um, on the Navajo Nation, I'd have to say it was very difficult to navigate. Uh, but we, I had to navigate, you know, through, um, you know, just reaching out through the grapevine. Um, you know, it was very difficult for everybody during that time. You know, we, everybody was at home. You know, we were, we were just kind of, a, we were, it was unique. We were in a unique situation because we were good to go. We were ready to. Uh, Ancient waves is the first, the first and the only right now, river guiding company permitted with the Navajo Nation, and we're we're fixing the we're we're going to be work where we are working with BLM to get permitted because the Navajo Nation is bordered by the San Juan River which is where we run and we, we float all the time. So we see firsthand, you know, um, the, the need 
for uh, a river company out there because we're the stewards of the land. Just like John said, we take care of the land. You know, there's a lot of important medicine plants that are out there that unfortunately get trampled by the cattle. You know, um, that's a big problem that we see out there is the, the cattle. Um, that's, so we're out there as stewards of the land. You know, um, we, the support system is very um, non-existent, you know, for us, you know, us being a river rafting company. Um, we're very supportive on the, because we're, uh, us being the only Navajo river rafting company, you know, there's, we're, we're just kind of, we're being supported by the outside, the other, the industry from like, you know, there's the still, I just wanted to mention, um, the San Juan River during that whole pandemic was visited on a daily basis by hundreds of people. So um, I, that, that, there, were, there was a lot of support for us. You know, there's a lot of um, support from the, the industry, but actually I'd have to say the Navajo Nation is we we're, we're still trying to get their attention. You know, us being the, the only river rafting company we're trying to get bring the attention of the importance of the land management along the San Juan River, which is very, very rich in history, cultural history, um, environmental history, all the above. Um, so we, we're trying to build a, a support system. That's what we're trying to do. Um, it's actually non-existent. Like I mentioned, we're the, we're the only river rafting company on the Navajo Nation. So. Everybody understands that on the, in the industry because they, they know that the Navajo Nation is bordered by the San Juan River and the Colorado River. And they know that there's not one Navajo company until ancient waves arrive. So we are very fortunate to be out there and we're, um, we're excited, you know? So we, we're trying to seek support from the Navajo Nation. I mean, constantly trying to reach out um just i've been inviting you know officials out because the we see the, the non-existence of regulations you know um um the permitting system is um like just like john said archaic you know it's um even so we we have to it's a learning process for everybody i'd have to say all right um so I'd like to, yeah, thank, thank you for letting me talk. for. Thank you. Thank you. Past, our, John, what yeah. would you like to add to that? I just, I just think that when some of these tourism, I mean, back and back up to answer your question, um, I felt like there was, um, there was a, a adequate support for us um, during the COVID times. We could reach out and email. I mean, the emails were a little bit slow, but we still got, you know, some of our questions answered as far as getting um help from, um, we didn't get any PPE or nothing like that, uh, or the PPP. We just, uh, we did, we did a little application for the, um, I can't even remember the CARES Act, but, um, but what I didn't really um, understand was that it was all COVID related expenses. And so, I mean, we could only, I mean, we, every year I pay commercial insurance I pay lawyers to review my liability forms and my emergency plan and my COVID plan and everything that's in my packet. Um, all of our overhead costs and our operating expenses. We we have a um, we have a form 200. We're legit with the economic development. We have a federal tax ID. We have we're all legitimate. We pay every year close to six thousand dollars. But I don't like that the bottom line is the grazing officials. I wish I knew that the process was let's first hit the big obstacles before I spend any money. Cause with my partner, I keep wanting to dissolve our company because there is no way the Navajo nation supports recreation development. And like Lewis was saying, um, if we were to go the river rafting route, I mean, we do pack rafting stuff too. We, we can do tours, but the problem is though, you still have to go through BLM. And then when you go try to get a permit for the river left on the Navajo side, there's no process. There's no process in place for you to reserve campgrounds to get, you still have to do BLM and get drawn through a lottery. There's the Navajo Nation doesn't do that. Uh, we, I've been helping Mr. Brown uh, with um, 
his uh, Tri-City Tourism and how we could develop recreational opportunities around Denahotso. But um, yeah, but there's too many obstacles. Uh, maybe he can help with that, but I don't know. But I, I, I figured that um, if there were ever um, a chance to revamp some of these tourism laws to, to, to help uh, future recreation companies, that people like Lewis and I and other people should be at the table. Instead, it's all done probably behind closed doors with no invites. And, but that's my recommendation and thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, Mr. McCabe, um, what do you think? Do you repeat the question again? Do you think the, that the resources um, and supports exist uh, but aren't being accessed? Are there truly no support networks and resources? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, for tourism um, and doing your land withdrawal to start, say, like a tourism tour company, for my office, what we do is we assist, meaning that we partner with the business owner. Uh, say they need a survey and they need a bio and they need some other stuff done. Uh, that they possibly could not afford on their own, what we do is we go into a partnership in order to assist them, and we usually pick up half the cost. Um, and that resource has always been there, well, since I arrived, and I've been continuing to partner with many uh, other uh, offices in order to uh, upgrade some of the area's uh, destinations that need it. Um, so I, it, from my office, the resource is there. Um, say we get a, we get a, a campaign for outdoor biking, and of course we know now that John uh, is a owner of an outdoor biking. Uh, we would reach out to him and ask him if he'd like to take that ad, and we'd pay for it, in order to help his business move further. Those are the type of resources we assist with. Um, uh, campaigning, or like I said, if you have a grant that you want to apply for, but most of them say that you must be a government entity, we can partner with you uh, and help you with the grant in order to administer it and use it uh, where it is needed. Um, as far as other businesses, uh, I'm sorry, as far as other offices, I know that there is a lot of red tape um, that really goes into actually just starting a business. Um, and um, for us, we are a resource to all those um, businesses that are housed under the tourism industry. So if you ever need help, um, use us as a resource. I have staff uh, here who are more than willing to help. Uh, we go out of our way to meetings when we need to be there, we'll be there uh, in person if needed, Zoom if needed, but you just need to invite us. Even if you don't think that we can be a resource at any meeting that has to do with tourism, I would recommend that you invite us because we have other partners that we use within the states. So for me, my office is a resource. And um, if you are able to apply for many of this funding that is out there now, I would recommend that you do so. Um, it's there for all of you as businesses. And I do know that the Navajo Nation lost 115 million just on the Arizona side. Um, and that's a lot of money to lose in the tourism industry. So uh, like, again, use us as a resource. Thank you. And I have a question for each of you. Um, if each of you had to categorize the issues and challenges to the Navajo tourism industry, what issues would you tackle today versus tomorrow? Oh, I can go ahead. Again, my, my first thing would just be that whole grazing official thing. We attended a, a meeting at Parks and Rec on November 1st, and 
it was it was funny, but it was also sad to hear that the laws say that people who hold a grazing rights and you're riding um, on a dirt road past it say that they're not supposed to be paid or anything like that. But at this tourism meeting or the Parks and Rec meeting on the first, it was kind of tongue in cheek that, but you can pay them if you want. And I didn't like that because it sets a precedence. I guess apparently I need to go meet with these people who are holding a grazing permit and ask them what it's going to take. Maybe I can go apply for the funding that Arvel has just and hand it over to them. I don't know what it's going to take, but I would prefer that I would know all my obstacles first before I have to pay any funds every year. Cause like we started in 2016 and all my cut fees to get started every year to turn in every year, commercial insurance, all this stuff is about 6,000 every year. And we spend that every year and we still have not run one tour today because of the bottom signature of, a, of the grazing official. But that's all I have. All right, so go. go ahead, Lewis. Okay, um, so to categorize the issues and challenges to the Navajo tourism industry um, for short term, um, I put I put down permitting, the permitting issue and the influx of tourists that continued throughout that the COVID pandemic. Um, we I saw. I was out there on the river floating and see river left, you know, just riddled with visitors. And this is the time when the closure was going on. Navajo Nation was supposed to be closed. But the, there was still a lot of um, people out there without permits. So I saw the short term effect was the permitting issue was it was big. You know, there was a lot of lost revenue out there. So I saw that. Short term was the accommodating people. Um, so I just wanna to, to inform everybody that this, you know, the, what we do out here is very, very much needed by the public. You know, this is, this, the tourism industry is very important in different aspects. You know, I take people out there that have been cooped up and that I have that need to be out and to need to be out there and to, to connect with nature. So I saw an influx of people coming in during that time and we didn't have any accommodations. You know, people, we had accommodations where I reside up in Bluff and Blanding. Every, there was campsites still available, but if you go on the Navajo reservation, there was all shut down. So there was a lack of accommodations for that short term um, effect of that COVID on, for the Navajo tourism industry, you know, um, like I mentioned, it's this we're safe. Just like John said, we meet people out there. You know, we don't have to transport people. You know, I book trips, and in most cases, I meet my guests out there on the trail, and then we meet each. We we follow, they follow me, and six feet apart at least. You know, we're still wearing masks, so we we do everything according to according to the protocols medical advice you know the medical advice you got to have ventilation we're high you know so we are very much following all the protocols and so I, um you know accommodations it needs to be we need to accommodate these people they were out there i saw it firsthand i saw it, it was so many people out there Great. um Thank short you. term yeah um just want to say long term you know you know we want to change the culture you know um we don't want to just we don't want to be labeled as just tourism guides that just take people out for, for, um, just for a really quick fix, you know, just to get some photos and that's it. We, we need to change the culture where we're guides to help people, you know, in the long run, you know, we're very, when we're guides, we're out there, we're counselors, we're, we're coaches, you know, we're, 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 we're all the above. We're very much like I mentioned, you know, I wasn't labeled essential, but when I, when the COVID-19 was going on, you know, people were caught coming to me to take, to lead them out on tours so they could seek mental health, you know, so we were, we were essential, I could say. So that was a long term. We need to change it to where we're, um, we need to focus on culture, you know, that's big. We can't just shut down the culture. That's part of tourism is culture. So we got to prolong that. And I just, we need to think of ways to really 
continue that in those times. So. Well, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, I know we're over on time, but I have one more thing. So for our audience members, uh, Mr. McCabe's department, um, Navajo Tourism, sits within the Navajo Nation Division of Economic Development. This means tourism is considered a component of Navajo economic development. Um, Navajo DED sits it within their purview of the Navajo Nation President's Office. So this question is for Mr. McCabe. Um, would you say it's the Navajo Tourism Department's um, place and role in influencing the support of Navajo business reopening? Um, if tourism doesn't have decision-making authority to start issuing permits to tour operators, is there an alternative service it can provide? Uh, <clears throat> as far as issuing um, permits that lies directly under the Parks and Recreation Department, um, due to they are in charge of um, the Navajo Nation parks. Uh, that's part of their uh, business that they um, oversee those, those um, permits. Uh, as for my office, um, we get a lot of, uh, I hate to say it, but complaints. Uh, knowing that we have been open the whole time. The only time we were closed uh, during the pandemic was the first week from the 13th to whatever that week was. Uh, we were told that we were essential, so we reported back to work the following Monday. And as was stated, everything shut down, so we were one of those uh, offices that took calls uh, and directed people on where they needed to go, who they needed to talk to. Uh, businesses were closed, so we were getting all the calls here at Tourism. Um, for myself, I see, I still know that we are a resource to the tourism industry. The one thing that I would recommend is that we maybe pull together a meeting with Parks and Rec and start to address some of those items and issues that were brought up here today, such as the permits that are needed, and change the law and start getting it to move forward. Um, there are always loopholes. Um, I hate to say it, but that's what I usually look for in a law is a loophole um, to get some of these through. Um, and I think that with working together with um, the tour guides, uh, with Parks and Rec, myself, uh, the attorneys from DOJ, we can sit down and come up with a document that we can submit uh, and stand behind as tourism, uh, as a tourism industry, the tourism part from the government. Um, and that's just um, me stating that, uh, yes, we're, we're behind that. We're, we're totally for all businesses that pertain to the tourism industry. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. McCabe. Um, thank you, Mr. Yazi and Mr. Williams also for your insight and being on this panel today. Uh, we do wanna leave some um, time for members of our audience to share their experiences or to ask questions or share their ideas for ARPA priorities. Um, if you'd like to speak, um, raise your Zoom hand. If you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and um, enter your question in the Q&A and then we will um, go through those questions. Christine, we have a question in the Q&A from Kelsey. I'll let you go ahead and read it out. Okay, so this question comes from Kelsey. Um, not a question, but a comment. Um, I, she says, but I think if the reservation had better infrastructure and had a beautification process of the community, <laughs> the people who do tourism and sell on the roadside could see an increase. Uh, question for Mr. McCabe from Kelsey. She asks, can your office serve as a mediator? Oh, it disappeared. <laughs> so I didn't see that question. I didn't get to read the full question. It's in the answer column. I'll go ahead and read it. Can your okay. office serve as a mediator if the community is in conflict with the Parks and Rec office? Okay, so. Uh, the answer to that question is no, since we are a government entity also. 
um, that would have to be taken up between Parks and Rec and the division director. Um, I know that in the past, this has come up and a lot of um, the, the businesses have come to my office and pleaded for our assistance, but if they lie directly under the Parks and Recreation Office, uh, we don't get involved. We just recommend that they take it up the chain until it actually lands on the president's desk, uh, at which time he can appoint us to get involved. And at that time we would. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCabe. Um, I do see that Jermaine Simonson has her hand raised. So go ahead and ask your question, Jermaine. I'm sorry, I I'm, I didn't uh, take, I didn't pay attention. I didn't know I, it was only a question. Can I make a comment? Sure. Okay, well, I, I loved um, hearing everybody on the panel. I really appreciate uh, Mr. McKay being available as well. And um, I'm just, you know, I would hope that um, sometime soon uh, the president or whoever that has these powers, I hope they pull together um, a team that really puts together a good um you know, regulation policy uh, for more tourism to happen, ecotourism to happen on Navajo. And uh, I feel, you know, that the, you know, the world is, is waiting and they're ready and they're coming um, for these things. And, and, and of course, we're going to, you know, um, consider the impacts to the land, um, making sure that, you know, it, it's safe and it's sustainable. Um, but I, you know, this is really, um, you know, you go to, there's all kinds of numbers out there, um, you know, and in Bentonville in one year, their um, economy, their revenue was just, just biking alone was $50 million in one year. Um, and so I, I, you know, this really is, you know, the, the future. And this is an opportunity for a, a whole bunch of small businesses to sprout and to begin. And they really need that support. And I would hope that our Navajo Nation, because uh, if there was a way to do without them, it, of course, we all kind of, you know, maybe wish that a, a along the way, but, um, uh, you know, we're a, a nation. So clearly they have to, they hold the pin to a lot of them. Um, things and so hopefully you know they can really get pull themselves together and and find a good group that makes this uh gets this into motion so that's all i have to say thank you thank you, thank Jermaine. you. um we do have um, a question here um i will read it um it comes from c wadsworth I appreciate so much support for the Navajo led businesses to bring more tourism to Navajo country. Can this be done for Navajo people wanting to start a nonprofit to improve their community? I know many Navajo people not trying to bring revenue, but using monetary donations and personal funds to take action in their community needs. People providing trash pickup services, support services for unsheltered relatives and help with dog, um, cats, stray population, et cetera. It's great to see increased tourism to bring more business to Navajo country. But when people outside our nation come to visit, you cannot ignore the visible issues with Navajo, uh, that Navajo people face. But there are just Navajo people out there trying to make improvements such as change, um, just as Change Labs is a nonprofit trying to improve the community needs. Is there support for Navajo individuals also trying to establish an organization to help the community instead of making revenue? Uh, there are many nonprofit organizations that are operating during this time that I have never seen prior to the pandemic. But it's good that they are coming on to Navajo. And uh, for myself, I really am one of those who advocate for the animal population. And I'm probably one of those that's in the way with my grazing permit. So <laughs> don't hold that against me. <laughs> um, 
but soul dog rescue, you have um, those that address spayed, neutering, and also for someone to turn their dog over so they could find them homes. Um, a lot of the animal shelters here, um, soul dog rescue comes through and picks up all those dogs that can be saved uh, that are not uh, aggressive. Um, I know that uh, there are other um, nonprofit organizations that help many communities close to this side by Windorock, um, all those areas. And I, I know that because I'm from here in Navajo, New Mexico. And of course, I have to look out for my community and see what is being provided. And I'm, I have to be the one to say, yes, we can accept it. No, we can't. Because uh, there's also those organizations that have been giving uh, food monet food donations that um, that are expired and we kind of ended up with pallets of that and we had to dispose of that. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of be careful when you're working with nonprofit organizations that are um, doing or trying to assist a community, but I, I guess um, you have to know or hear uh, of the good things they've done in the past. But um, I, I do agree that a lot of those uh, organizations are out and about now. And um, uh, just be careful when you accept things from them. Make sure that you kind of do your homework and find out what they're about. Thank you for that answer, Mr. McCabe. Um, I do have another person with um, hand raised, uh, Jerry Henry, go ahead and ask your question or make your comment. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, to, uh, um, my name is Jerry Henry. I'm originally from Chinle, Canyon de Chez, um, Chinle, Arizona. Uh, I live here in Gallup now, uh, Gallup, New Mexico. I just had a quick question. It's probably directed more toward Arvel, but um, I was curious, I, in living in Gallup um, here for the past four years, I noticed that there's quite a few um, uh, vendors and artisans that really um, need help in the sense of, um, you know, being able to raise their prices so that they can get um, food on the table, but then also to do it in a way where they could have, um, you know, have some assistance um, maybe online so that they're not working so hard sitting all day, you know, at in front of Earl's restaurant selling or, um, you know, sitting on the roadside anywhere else on the Navajo Nation. And I've just seen a lot of people that are really super talented. And a lot of them are even, you know, at the flea markets. And I also have relatives that are, um, that also sell there every weekend. Um, you know, they, they have, uh, I think, Windorock on Friday, uh, Gallup on Saturday, and I think Kienta and different places like that in, in um, different times of the week. Um, I'm just curious if there's something that the Navajo Nation is doing or can do or has done and it didn't work out. Is there something where um, we can help these guys, especially the elderly who don't know how to use the internet, who don't know how to, um, you know, you know, speak speak English uh, fluently to where they can actually get sales from tourists and from just other not or other you know um, natives as well, other Navajo people. Is there something out there currently that maybe we could um, we could um, encourage and push? Um, for myself, I'm actually a small business owner. I'm a photographer here in Gallup. Um, I did most of my work in Chin Lee, um, uh, portraiture type uh, photography work, um, and was getting pretty successful there in Chin Lee, but um, but um, because there's no proper living conditions in Chinle in regards to like being able to buy housing and that type of thing. Um, we moved to Gallup and um, it kind of seemed like as soon as that took place, uh, the pandemic hit. And so I've been shut down for a year homeschooling my son. And um, I want to know, I guess, um, as an individual person, um, you know, is there something where just kind of living here in Gallup, I've seen the, the changes or like, I guess I've seen how many people are actually really dependent on um, their own crafts and arts and crafts um, to kind of put food on the table. Um, 
is there something that we can help with to help advertise them more? Is there something, um, some type of grant or loan where if somebody wanted to assist in that, um, what route would we go in doing something of that nature? Um, because I know that my husband are def my husband and I are definitely interested in in some type of work in that direction to help our community and give back to the Navajo Nation. Thank you. As for assisting artisans, um, I know that economic development has uh, some staff members who are working on a listing for artisans. Uh, I'm not sure who's all on that listing. I don't have that information. But as far as my office, we usually, um, one of my staff members has put together a list of artisans, what they do, uh, if they have websites, a phone number and things like that. And usually we get calls from tourists who are looking for a certain type of rug, a certain type of um, bracelet, rings, those type of things. And usually the names that we have that we've collected over the years, we recommend that they get in touch with that individual and um, talk with the individual to see if they can make a sale. Um, that is about the extent of my office uh, otherwise, again, we go by the BRD listing for those that are signed up as businesses and uh, let them know that there is also a listing there. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. I do want to just read the one question in here so that way everyone can hear it. Um, uh, the question was um, from Sherilyn Yazi, can Change Labs be a place for small businesses to be, for us to begin to advocate for ourselves for changing land laws or anything else that helps us to be more successful? A lot of us want to make a living on our homelands. And Jessica Stego um, answered this. She says, thank you, Sherilyn. Yes, Change Labs is a part of a Navajo entrepreneurship coalition that is discussing ways to create new pathways for founders of companies and nonprofits. We are also engaged in a larger Southwest Na Native Business Coalition looking at how we engage organizations to open access to capital and other larger issues. We have a lot going on and welcome ideas as to how to get everyone on the same page and how to engage our stakeholders. Thank you for that answer, Jessica. And um, Heather, do you want to wrap this up or would you like me to read this? Absolutely. We are over time and we appreciate everybody who um, added their thoughts and their comments and their questions. But above all, we want to thank Mr. Williams, Mr. Yazi, and Mr. McCabe for joining us today and sharing their stories and their thoughts. Um, I just want to emphasize here that this is the first conversation that we're hosting over the next few weeks. So um, for those of you who maybe had a question and didn't get it added in or have another idea, uh, join us next Wednesday. We'll be doing this again. We'll be focused on food and hospitality. And then again, on December 1st, we'll be looking at artisans, retail, and professional service providers. And then finally, on December 8th, we're going to take everything that we've learned from Mr. McCabe, um, Mr. Yazi, and Mr. Williams and synthesize that into a final discussion around ARPA priorities. If you have any questions about Change Labs, um, I'm put putting up now our website and some contact information for our colleague, Marsha Grayeyes in Tuba City. Thank you all for joining us and I hope to see some of you next Wednesday.